Now, on this Invest Talk podcast, Justin Klein listens to your questions. What does it mean when a company's share price falls to cheap prices and executive insiders don't buy more? My question is how much of your portfolio should you put into like ETFs and mutual funds? I had a question about Dutch Bros. It's going to be a new IPO. And provides unbiased answers. I think the bet on the raw materials that go into electric cars are going to be far better than the electric car producers. Invest Talk across America and around the world. Your participation makes it unique. 888-99-CHART. This podcast is produced by KPP Financial. Steve Peasley, President. KPP Financial. Independent thinking, shared success. And now today's podcast. Good afternoon, fellow investors, and welcome back to Invest Talk. This is our May 23rd, 2022 edition of Invest Talk. I'm excited for this hour with you. I'm Justin Klein, and I'm here to answer your finance and investment questions. I'm going to do my very best to make it informative and instructive so that you can make better decisions with your money each and every day, uh, especially in these more volatile times. You know, when everything's going up and liquidity is abundant, you can kind of throw a dart at anything and you're going to make money. Now, most people don't know whether they're making enough money or not compared to the market, compared to the risk they're taking, etc. But most people just feel good because things are going up and they're seeing positive returns. Well, in the new world that we're living in today, post COVID, we have inflation, and we have lower liquidity, higher interest rates. And this is something that you're going to have to get used to. And it's no longer just about having positive returns. Because guess what? If you have a 5% return, but inflation is 8%, your real return is negative 3%. But you're going to look at your portfolio and say it's up, it's positive. But that's not really what investing is about. Investing is about improving your financial position. And having negative real returns is not, it's not improving your, your position. So you always have to look at things in context. And for the last 40 years ish, we've been dealing with a disinflationary environment where central banks are trying to add liquidity consistently to get inflation up. And in a, and now it's a different world. And so you need to understand the difference and invest accordingly. So that's why I'm here. I'm here to help you navigate through this new environment where it's about today, it's not about the future. It's about businesses that can create value, both for their end customer, as well as for shareholders. And so that's what I'm here to unpack for you is understanding what that means, understanding the tools you need to make those decisions. And if you're using the old playbook, you're playing the wrong game because it's a new game. It's a new world. So I'm here to answer your unbiased questions and give you the straight facts. And I'm going, to, I'm going to operate with my mission statement, which is always independent thinking and shared success. So no matter what I'm talking about, market as a whole, strategy, sector, I'm here to present it all without bias. So we're going to start off with our first caller now. Hi, Stephen Justin, longtime listener here. I've got a question about NVIDIA stock, NVDA. Uh, just wondering at the 170 to 175 level, 
What are your guys' thoughts? It's down quite a bit. Is it time to jump back into that and uh, try to capture some of that 40% upside or wait a bit until it goes a bit lower? Be interested in what you think is an entry point for NVIDIA or if that's a good investment at all. Thanks. All right. Another question about a high growth tech stock. Hope you're getting the understanding, everyone out there, that this is not the end. The end of the cycle, the down cycle for these tech stocks is when we stop getting calls about it. Okay. And we, and, and everybody gets over the space is despondent about it. No, most people are still trying to buy the dip and Nvidia trades at 38 times enterprise value to EBITDA 38 times. Now, why that's down from what it used to be, that's still a very high multiple. Price to sales ratio, 16 times. One six. Very, very high. This still is nowhere close to a reasonable value. It's at 168, down 51% from, from its 52 week high. I think this goes well below $100 a share. And remember, a lot of this had to do with crypto. And if it's crypto, it's part of the cycle as well. Because less profitable to mine crypto in times of, you know, bear markets. And then there was just over, over allocation or over, over consuming of computers and gaming systems because people were home, nothing else to do. So this has much lower to go and analysts are continue, are continuing to downgrade their earnings projections for this year and next year. So completely pass to much, much, much lower. Now let's go to Jacob in the Bay area, looking at EA electronic arts. You own it or looking to buy it? Uh, I own it. I've owned it for about the last three years, kind of got in right around the beginning of COVID, um, but it's kind of just done nothing for me. So I was thinking, uh, what you think about getting out of it? Well, Electronic Arts is, uh, the chart is in a downtrend. That's definitely uh, worries me. And you're at the kind of the high end of this downtrend channel. So I like what you're looking at from the technical perspective, that this is up into resistance and the overall trend is now pointed down. Now, the good thing is they don't have any debt and enterprise value EBIT is 22, which is, you know, kind of on the expensive side. Uh, and historically, this has traded closer to the mid teens over the long term. Yeah, the last couple of years now, but uh, historically kind of closer to the low to the mid teens and we're at 22. Uh, so I, I agree. I think this is it's not undervalued. It's not drastically overvalued, um, but I would say that. It, it definitely is a good opportunity for here to at least trim your position. Uh, and once again, just like NVIDIA, the analysts are downgrading earnings expectations for this year and next. So, yeah, I would trim it or eliminate it up here. Thanks for the call. Right, thank you. Now, Steve and I are thankful for your podcast support and our free downloads. We'll always continue, but I want to make you aware of two other ways to find our material. One is our, our and best talk Instagram account as well as our YouTube channel so you can head over there and subscribe we're building up both platforms so keep an eye out for more to come over there now the best talk phone lines are open so give me a call now at 888-99 chart Why do listener questions make Invest Talk better? Which of these would you recommend? Because each caller presents fresh questions in their voice. I was curious if you still think aluminum has a ways to go from here. When do I know the right time to take profits? Should I be looking for an exit? Should I be holding here? And listeners instinctively realize that Invest Talk uniquely offers a welcome dose of investing satisfaction. I think have a terrific show and I've learned a whole lot. Hey guys, love your show. Uh, I've been listening for several years now and I've 
Learned a lot. Justin Klein and Steve Peasley understand what investors need and want. I would look at it from a tax perspective. If there's no tax implications, move on, find better ways to use that money. I'm going with the odds. I think a half position now would at least get you in it and get you watching it so you won't lose track of it. Don't forget to call Investor. 888-99-CHART. One of the most rewarding things I do each weekday is host the Invest Talk podcast. I truly enjoy helping investors, and I know that every question counts and every answer I provide will be unbiased. You, the caller, get to chart the course for each Invest Talk podcast. Call with your questions anytime, day or night, 888 99Chart. 888 99Chart, 888 now, our main focus point today is based on the story. A Harvard economist says two major factors indicate a recession is far from certain. So we're going to look at what he is considering. His theory is about the strength of the consumer as well as inflation moderating. And I think there's some argument to that, but I don't think it's also the end all be all. But we're going to look at that story as well as target dated funds, target dated funds and 401ks. Most 401ks are getting hit harder than they have in the past by decline in equity prices. And I'm going to talk about why that is, and it's a big flaw in target data funds. Also, while shale drillers and other oil companies are pumping out dividends more than oil and gas and going back to incentives there. And I think that's uh, that would be interesting to take a look at and you always want to understand incentives, anything you do, uh, because it typically drives outcomes. And then lastly, you're, we're going to discuss uh, the home, the housing market, and where we're seeing sales cooling. So we're going to look at that. But ultimately, I want to know what's on your mind. 888 chart is how you get through and ask your question on today's show. Let's take a look at the market today. We had a solid bounce back on uh, after OPEX last week, but a 2% move in the S&P 500. The NASDAQ that was up, let's see, about 180 points, about 1.5% there. You definitely saw this is one of those interesting up days where value drastically outperformed growth uh, in a big, big way. And so you continue to see that outperformance on up days and down days. And part of that surely was the fact that the 10 year was up about seven basis points. So higher interest rates uh, certainly hurt there. You had the dollar down pretty big, which was uh, very interesting to see that start to reverse a bit. And you're continuing to see signs from the fixed income market as well as the bond market that the Fed is going to start to soften its stance. And I think a lot of this has to do with the economic numbers that have come out, the cooling in the housing market that is actually faster than I think anybody expected. And that's going to cause the Fed to be less hawkish. Doesn't mean they aren't going to be hawkish. It's just you know, the, the level of hawkishness and the pace of hawkishness, I think, is what is always important to the market. And, and so the, the bond market and fixed income markets are starting to hint at that. And you're getting a little bit of bounce here. Definitely some in, in, in equity markets. A lot of it has to do with the object, OPEX expiring or going to the end of the month. There's some rebalancing that's uh, likely to happen through the end of the month as equities have underperformed. Uh, and in uh, certain types of strategies that are pretty popular you when, when equities are weak and bonds are relatively strong which they have been this month you see buying at the end of the month for rebalancing purposes on the equity side so that's kind of what you've seen uh, i think today and we'll probably see through the end of the month now we're going to pivot over to an itunes review question movie goer says what do you think of robo advisors such as vanguard I normally invest in Vanguard ETFs and decided to give this service a try a year ago. It automated and I don't watch it or make purchases. They claim to base it off my risk tolerance and will automatically adjust my prior portfolio to help meet my retirement goals. There you go. 
That's an example is the robo advisor services. That's what they do is they rebalance kind of on a regular basis, often monthly, and try to target a particular risk tolerance level. Now, the issue with the vast majority of these robo advisors is they're just using index funds. And what are index funds doing? We've talked about many times. They're leaning towards the growth side of the market because they're investing in the S&P. They're investing in the total stock market index. They're investing in just an indices that is that is market cap weighted and weighted towards the very largest companies in the market, which typically are those big mega cap techs. And that's why those are underperforming in a big, big way. So are they better than you using indexes to do it on your own? Probably because they're going to be a little more disciplined than you are, uh, but it definitely isn't the perfect solution. Now we're heading into a break, so give me a call at 888 chart Each day, Invest Talk listeners submit their finance and investment questions via phone or email. Would you like your question to be put near the top of the list? Just take a minute or two to leave a review and rating for Invest Talk at iTunes. And be sure to include a brief question with your iTunes review comments. Now, my focus point today is about a Harvard economist. And I will say there's a bit of bias here. This is Jason Furman. He's a Harvard professor, but he's also the former president uh, economic advisor under Barack Obama. So clearly, you have connections to the Democratic Party, Democrat in office, you're going to be a little bit more supportive, a little bit more, let's just say bias. Uh, and I think that seeps in here a bit. Now, he's indicating there's two major factors that are going to prevent a recession, or at least he thinks it's far from certain. And I would agree with him. Uh, I think that uh, the whole, oh, we're going to recession thing is a bit overblown. I feel like th this is more of a economic normalization. Now, just like when, you know, you have, everyone's had a little bit too much alcohol at, at a time, you wake up the next morning, your body is normalizing. What do you have? You have a hangover. And I think there's a lot of hangover that's happening in the economy today. But that doesn't mean that your entire health is deteriorating. You know, you just need some water, have some food, take a shower, feel a little better. And that's kind of what this is. It's a hangover from a massive, massive, massive amount of stimulus, both on the fiscal and the monetary side over the past two years. And what's underrated is Things like the mortgage and rent moratoriums, student loan moratoriums, thing, all of those things where people didn't have to pay on their loans of various kinds. And they're some of their largest outflows each month, their mortgage and their rent. And so all these things are, are rolling off. Now, he points to interest rates going up. And that's creating a lot of volatility as interest rates go up. Bonds are more attractive, stocks less attractive. That's natural. It's duration risk there. So that's kind of stating the obvious. He also points to the lockdowns in China affecting manufacturing. And I think that is underrated. That is very underrated. Uh, what type of continued inflation that's cause, causing uh, less economic activity due to uh, those lockdowns and, and less trade. And so there's some impact there. But he says the consumer is in good shape, which is true. But if you look at credit card delinquencies, you look at credit card balances, they are now on the rise. Still more of a hangover back to normal levels, but trajectory is definitely worrisome. And he says consumers have about $2.3 trillion in excess savings that they accumulated. But a lot of that, once again, has been kind of sopped up. The big thing that he that he speaks about is unemployment and the fact that unemployment is very low. And that is certainly true. And I think that is the main argument is that, hey, if you need a job, you can pretty much get a job. You could. 
you work hard enough, you, you, you maybe not the job that you really want, but there are jobs out there for people that want jobs. And then lastly, inflation is going to cool. I said this many times. You have oil go from 50 to 100. That's 100% inflation in oil. In order for oil to continue at 100% inflation, you to go from 100 to 200. It's called base effects. It's a simple concept, but a lot of people overlook it. And so those base effects are, are going to come into play. And now just cooling of housing markets, uh, just the economy in general, that's bringing down inflation indications as well. If you look at some of the, the factors that are more real time, not looking back in January, February, you know, we're almost into June. And so understanding those trends are, are vital to show that unemployment's low, inflation is coming down, but the trajectory, I think that's the main thing. Trajectory is going back towards normalization, but everything can overshoot, especially momentum kind of uh, takes hold and gets into a consumer psyche. And that will change ultimate outcomes of economic activity and create this kind of self-fulfilling process uh, that, that takes the economy lower. Now, equities have come down. A lot of this is duration risk of long duration assets uh, and higher interest rates. And the profit cycle is not negative quite yet. And so that's why I think you're seeing some support here in the market that, hey, earnings, while growth is slowing, are not going to reverse. And until they start going to reverse, I think you're still going to see some relative bids uh, in the market. So that's kind of where we're at. Now, on the next Invest Talk, we will dig into this story, the so-called $5 trillion wealth shock, cracking American nest eggs. Since the start of the year, the S&P 500 is down 18%, the NASDAQ down 27%, and the Bloomberg Index of Cryptocurrencies, 48% in the negative. Are you feeling the pain? And what can you do to lessen the impact? Steve's going to talk about, actually, I'm talking about that tomorrow. Steve's out until Friday. But for now, I'm Justin Klein. I'm ready to take your questions live at 888-99-CHART. Investing doesn't have to be intimidating. In fact, accessible investing happens every day on the Acorns app. Acorns takes your spare change from your daily purchases and invests it into portfolios that could grow with time. On average, Acorns users invest $490 a year from spare change alone. Start putting your spare change to work and get a bonus $10 investment when you sign up at acorns.com slash invest10. Remember to consider your investment objectives before investing. For further information and disclosures, visit acorns.com. Experience the power of 5G with T-Mobile. With faster 5G speeds nationwide, you can upload your favorite videos super fast or game on the go. Plus, T-Mobile has more 5G bars in more places, so you can stay connected to what matters most from almost anywhere. Switch to T-Mobile today, the leader in 5G. T-Mobile has America's largest 5G network, fastest based on median overall combined 5G speeds according to analysis by Ookla of Speed Test Intelligence Data 5G Speeds for Q4 2021. See 5G device coverage and access details at T-Mobile.com. For investors, the goal of achieving financial freedom requires unbiased information, strategic planning, and determination. Congratulations. You found the podcast that is dedicated to helping you succeed. Invest Talk. Hi, Steve. Hi, Justin Cannon from Atlanta, Georgia. I called probably back in December about ticker symbol ELY Callaway because I was interested in their large uh, acquisition of Top Golf. That's made it really attractive to me. At the time, you advised holding off until it reached the teens. I believe it was trading $28, $29 around that time. Currently today, it's in the $18 range. Glad I listened to you guys. I'm really interested in starting a large position at this point. What would your opinions be at this point? Um, what's changed materially in the past six months? Looking very attractive at the moment. Would love your opinion. Ticker symbol E-L-Y Callaway. Thank you. All right. Looking at Callaway Golf, E-L-Y is the symbol. And yeah, glad you didn't buy it back then. And it has hit the teens, trading at 19, spot 85 currently. Uh, but the question is, is it is it there yet? Is it cheap enough yet? And is this a company that you'd still want to own longer term? 
I think that's my continued worry is that golf is, does not have good user trends. <laughs> you know, it was popular during the COVID shutdown. Um, but it's continues to struggle profitably. Uh, peak earnings was to 2019, $1.10. Supposed to make 81 cents this year, up 4%, 90 cents next year. <sighs> Sales were sick, up 60% year over year, but earnings were down 42% last quarter. Why is that? They're issuing a ton more shares. They had 96 million shares outstanding in 2019. Now 196 million shares. Clearly, they paid for the top golf acquisition with equity looks like. And I don't like the chart trend. I just don't see anything here that gets me uber excited. It's in a downtrend. I see no capitulation volume that tells me investors have uh, given up. Negative cash flow. Is it worth 20 times forward earnings? I don't think so. Turn equities low. So, yeah, I mean, is it better value than 29 at 19? Sure. But I see no indication that this is going to turn around anytime soon. So unless you have some insight that Top Golf is taking off and that's going to be material uh, impact to, 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 to earnings, you know, I wouldn't get excited about this name. So I'm passing on E-L-Y Callaway. Let's go to Taylor in Philadelphia looking at Napa, N-A-P-A, which is, I believe, hey. Duckhorn Wines. Yeah, Duckhorn Portfolio, Justin. How you doing? Doing um, pretty well. So you're looking uh, at Duckhorn. Uh, good wines. I've had their wine. Uh, you Is that why you're looking at this name? You just love their wines? Um, yeah, it's, it's a small cap growth company that um, is reasonably new to the, the public market. I think they came out mm -hmm. two years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so I know that you guys have not been in favor, or the market's not been in favor of growth in general, but I, I feel like you've said there's, if you want to start taking your shots at some growth names, you know, here's the market bottoms out, it might be a good place. And I feel like they have a fairly good moat because they have good brands, um, good brands that uh, people like and recognize, and um, particularly internationally. I feel like they have a lot of, uh, um, international brand recognition in that. So I just want to see the sell the company. <sighs> well, you're right. There are some growth companies, especially on the smaller side, that are starting to get kind of the baby thrown out with the bathwater and becoming great values. The question is, is Duckhorn one of them? Now, I will say the technicals are pretty nice compared to many in the space. Kind of neutral since they went public in May of last year, kind of around the, uh, the same price, high teens. But earnings, you know, they're going up year over year. The revenues last quarter only 18% year over year. Earnings were actually down 16% year over year for that one quarter. So it's be up 23% in total this year and then up 17% next year. Are you going to pay 40 times, 35, 40 times forward earnings for this? I just don't think it's cheap enough. Honestly, I like the brands, but am, am I going to pay, let's see, 23 times enterprise value EBITDA? I just don't think it's cheap enough, to be honest with you. I need this low teens for me to get excited about it. Uh, and clearly they're having problems with higher inflation impacting their earnings. And so I'm just going to pass. Uh, I think it's an interesting name to have in your watch list. I do agree that, uh, you should be looking for names like this, but it's just not quite there for me. Thanks for the call. Now let's touch a bit on how 401ks are being hit harder than they have in the past due to equities falling. And that's because targeted fund families are now shifting or have shifted over the past decade, a lot more of their portfolios into equities. 
Now, about 60% of new money, new contributions to 401ks go into these targeted plans or, or funds. And 40% of total 401k assets at places like Vanguard go into target dated funds. That's up from only 12% in 2010. So these are what are called QDIAs, Qualified Default Investment Alternatives. And this is the way that a lot of people, they set up their 401k, they don't know what to put it in. They see this target dated fund that says, oh, 2045. Oh, that sounds about the time I'm going to retire. They put it in that, set it and forget it. And they think that's all they need to do. Because it's overwhelming to them to figure out what other funds to invest in, what mix to have. Understandably, most people are not trained to do this, are not trained to, you know, they're trained for other things, whether it's being a teacher, whether it's uh, they're an engineer, whether it's uh, an oil service worker, whatever it is, whoever you are, the 401k, you're probably not trained to do this. And so that's why 60% of new money goes into this. The problem is, is that portfolios are starting to become riskier and riskier. Portfolios for youngest workers now invest 92% of contributions in stocks. That's up from 85% a decade ago. Some targeted funds have 100% of the portfolios and stocks for young workers. Mid-career workers, so maybe you're 45, they hold about 62% in stocks. That's up from 69% a decade ago. And those at retirement, their median exposure is now up from 43% in 2011 to 46. So not dramatic, but definitely material. And the reason that these fund families are saying this, they're doing this is because savers tend to leave their investments alone during good and bad times. The problem here is that there was very little money in target data funds back in 08. It was still kind of a new concept. And so the vast majority of the assets that are invested in target data funds have done been, uh, have, have done so during a bull market. And so sure, you only have a you know, 10, 15% pullback in stocks, most people aren't going to get freaked out about that. And so I think their reasoning is deeply flawed. Now, over the past two years, T. Rowe Price, the third largest target data provider, raised their target equity allocation and target data funds. 98% of contributions for the youngest workers are in stocks. That's up from 90 previously. Workers 20 years from retirement hold 95% in stocks. That's up from 85%. And 70-year-olds, now up from 46 to 51%. So not only have individuals been lulled into buying the dip, but targeted funds have as well. So I think it's important to understand that while targeted funds are decent compared to what most people are going to do that are uneducated, there's my biggest problem has always been with the glide path of, hey, we're going to get more conservative as time goes on. The problem is that they don't take into account how attractive an asset class is or not. And clearly, they've been investing in an expensive market, upping equity allocations. And that's been a big driver as well to over allocation to equities across the market. Now let's go back to the Best Talk Voice Bank for a question that came in earlier from Denmark. Hello, on this talk, Yannick from Denmark here. I have a question about Moody's Corporation ticker symbol MCO. I'd really, really like to own this stock. I think it has a strong uh, moat business-wise. I would like to hear what entry point you would um, recommend. Is it uh, cheap enough yet? It's fallen from its high for some time now. Sure like to hear your opinion. Thank you a lot for a great show. Bye. All right. This is Moody's and they're one of the largest credit rating agencies out there. And their business is suffering. Why? Credit market's tight. It's hard to raise capital. And if you're not issuing bonds, that means you're not paying a credit rating to rate it. And that's typically how they make money. And so that's why you saw revenues down 5%, earnings down 29% last quarter. 
and it's down 27% from its 52 week high. So clearly the market's priced in a lot of weakness. Now currently enterprise value is around 20. Over the last decade, it becomes cheap kind of in the mid to low teens. So we're not quite there, probably another 20% lower from here, which if you look technically, Yeah, that would be kind of around the uh, 250 mark. That's where I would think about picking this up. It's right around 295 now. So around 250 is a buy for me on Moody's. MCO is the symbol. Now, summer is just a couple weeks away. I know it's crazy. And you know that summer often is where there's the most volatility in markets. Do you know that? July, August, September, it's typically a, a more volatile time. So you think we've had volatility now, we're likely to see more volatility through the summer. Now, once again, volatility can move both ways. Rallies can be sharp as well as sell-offs be sudden. So the question is, are you prepared for the continued market rotation? Because that's really what this is going to be days like today where there's rallies still a rotation value much stronger than growth small caps starting to outperform why because the credit market isn't turning quite yet should you stay there is your how is your portfolio allocated is it heavy in large cap growth or small cap value are you overweight a particular sector that you should or shouldn't be? How do you know this? That's how you un that's how you properly manage a portfolio. Is understand these different aspects that will allow you to buck trends on the downside and go with the market and then some on the upside. So if you need help, Understanding where you're at, I encourage you to take advantage of our free portfolio view assessment via telephone or go to meeting. You can send us a message through investtalk.com or call our KPP financial office at 800 557 5461. We love to help you in any way. Next up, we'll play a listener question from Washington State. So hang on. The Invest Talk Voice Bank never closes. I have a question for you about Amazon. So your questions keep coming. Question about P.E. ratios. And that's okay because Steve Peasley and Justin Klein specialize in unbiased guidance. If I'm looking at a dividend company, I'm looking for consistency of earnings and dividends. Your standard daily chart typically goes back one year. Steve and Justin are fearless. So don't forget to call Invest Talk. 888-99-CHART. Hey guys, it's James from Washington State. Noticed that Target took a nosedive today, like a 27% nosedive. Current PE on it is about 15. Wondering what you guys think of that as far as an entry point. Appreciate the show. Thanks, bye. All right, Target TGT had a big reversal from the big rally in 2020. And along with Walmart had pretty bad earnings. 4% revenue growth year over year. Remember, that's an inflationary environment. So what's your real revenue growth? Certainly negative, okay? And then earnings were down 41% year over year. Higher fuel costs, transportation costs, harder to get goods, higher worker salaries, etc. And so earnings this year are expected to drop 16% year over year. And that's why you see this down 42.8% from its 52-week high. Now, Target, still a very good company, but clearly seeing some headwinds and a more normalization to its business from a sales standpoint and from an earnings standpoint, especially because pre-COVID, you didn't have the inflation inflationary environment and now consumers are retrenching. So you can go back to 2020 earnings of Six dollars and thirty nine cents. It's expensive if it's going to earn six dollars. Where does this level out at? So what I will say is definitely wouldn't own it until one thirty two. It's at one fifty three now. That's the next major support level, really one thirty two, one thirty three in that range. 
Now, could it go even lower? Certainly. Depends on you know, how they deal with the inflation and how the consumer reacts to higher interest rates. So while 133 is the next support level, it's not guaranteed to hold. Okay, that's target TGT. Now we're heading into our final break, so give me a call now at 888 chart This is Invest Talk. For serious investors, it's all about achieving financial freedom. That's why the unbiased guidance offered by Stephen Justin is so valuable. The Invest Talk Anytime listener lines are open now, and Stephen Justin welcome your questions. Call 888 99 Chart. Hi, Justin and Steve. This is Art, Southern California. My question is regarding tips. Actually, it's the Victor Tango India Papa V tip. So that's the ETF. If I have a lot of cash, a couple hundred thousand, let's say, obviously I want to put it someplace where I can earn some rate of return. And I'm thinking of investing it in the VTIP, it's the Vanguard Tips, Inflation Protected, earning about 5.5%. What's your thoughts on that, holding cash short-term? That means uh, within six months, a year, maybe, maybe even two years. Again, thanks all for all your answers and input. Keep it up. Thank you so much. Bye. All right, looking at VTIP. And the first thing I would say is don't bank on that 5%. If you think that you're going to earn 5% on this longer term, you're you're wrong. Uh, now that can be looked backward looking and those, uh, th- those for, for treasury inflation protected securities, which is that's what this investing in, the calculation there can be very misleading very, very misleading. So don't think you're going to get 5%. It's going to fluctuate based on inflation levels, etc. And it's always backward looking when you're looking at those figures. And then you have duration, you have some duration risk here. Now it's down about two and a half, three percent 3% since September. So not a ton because it's a short term. Uh, but don't think you're getting that rate. Okay, uh, it's going to be much less than that, most likely. Uh, so Find fund, uh, and I'll say about tips in general. They are decent inflation hedges, but not great. Okay, thanks for the call. 8899 chart, 8899 Now lastly, let's talk about shale drillers and just oil drillers in general. Now, there's an old saying, I forgot who, who coined it, but basically I think it was Charlie Munger from remembering correctly. And he said, show me the incentive and I'll show you the outcome. And that's kind of what you've seen over the last decade in the oil patch. For much of the shale boom starting around 2001, 2011, 2012, executives were paid to simply drill. Their bonuses were tied to output. But post the COVID crisis, that's no longer the case. Companies like Pioneer Natural Resources, Occidental Petroleum, Range Resources are shifting their executive pay. And they're now paid to keep costs down and return cash to shareholders. And this is based on investors' demand because they saw how value disruptive disruptive it was to simply pay based on output because there was no care in the world about whether this was a a project that actually would be beneficial to shareholders. Remember, incentives. Their incentive was not to be profitable. Just like a lot of tech companies, their incentives for the past X number of years have not been to be profitable. So they weren't. It was just their incentives were to grow their revenue base, whether that was economically viable, economically sustainable, economically profitable mattered not. And higher interest rates in the tech space is causing that to, is forcing that change. But lower prices in energy in 2020 kind of forced this. And so far, the energy shares are up 
46%, but the SP is down about 18%. And output remains below pandemic levels, even though oil is at 113, natural gas is now at uh, quadruple it was a couple of years ago to $8 per British thermal unit. And in the past year, where was it? There's there's a, a great stat. From 2010 to 2019, shale firms spent $1.1 trillion and they lost nearly $300 billion. And now, if you look at the way employees or empl executives are compensated, it's drastically weighted towards cash flow targets, return on capital metrics, environmental goals, and drastically away from higher yields, which means lower production, and sustainably higher prices for energy. So remember, it's all a cycle, and incentives create those cycles. I'm Justin Klein. This completes another Invest Talk program. Steve Peasley and I thank you for listening. We encourage you to tell your friends and family about our free podcast downloads. You can get yours anytime at iTunes, Spotify, or Google Play, and be sure to rate and review on iTunes. And if you leave your question with your review, we will prioritize your answer. Independent thinking, shared success. This is Invest Talk. Good night. Because of the nature of the interactive dialogue inherent in the format of this program, it's important for the listener to understand that not all comments made will apply to them specifically. Nothing said shall be taken to be investment advice, or shall statements on this program be considered an offer to buy or sell securities. Such advice is rendered solely on an individual basis and at times will require that the investor review a prospectus before investing. Invest Talk is a copyrighted program of Klein Pavlis Peasley Financial, a registered investment advisor, which retains all rights. For more information regarding KPP's investment advisors, call 1-800-557-5461.